Welcome to Sultan Brain Hub for a video on brainstem stroke. In this video, I will start by recapping the key vasculature which supplies the brainstem, then move on to talk about the various important functions of the brainstem in relation to strokes, and finally finish with a look at a few of the brainstem stroke syndromes to be familiar with as a medical student doing either your preclinical or clinical neuroscience modules. Let's start with the blood supply to the brainstem. Blood is derived from the posterior circulation, formed by the vertebral arteries, which join to form the basilar artery. From the two vertebral arteries come the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries, or PICA for short. From the basilar artery comes the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, or ACA, and also several small branches called the pontine arteries. Also from the basilar artery, we have the superior cerebellar arteries, and finally, the posterior cerebral arteries at the top. Let's look at the blood supply to particular regions of the brainstem. The medulla is predominantly supplied by the vertebral arteries and pica. The pons is supplied by acre, pontine arteries from the basilar artery, and superior cerebellar arteries. The midbrain is supplied predominantly by the posterior cerebral arteries. Now we can move on to talk about the various functions of the brainstem. As you know, the brainstem contains lots of important structures and its detailed anatomy is complex. We will consider the functions of the brainstem as divided into three main categories, tracts, nuclei and physiological centres. Clinically important tracts that run through the brainstem include the corticospinal tract, which is a motor pathway, and the spinothalamic and dorsal column tracts, which are sensory pathways. Damage to the corticospinal tract will result in weakness or paralysis of particular muscles. Damage to the spinothalamic tract will result in loss of pain and temperature sensation. As we're talking about the brainstem, these fibres have already decussated by this point, and thus the sensory loss will be contralateral to the lesion. The dorsal column pathway is less clinically important in brainstem stroke. Also, first order sympathetic neurons pass through the brainstem as they descend from the hypothalamus to the cervical spinal cord in the so-called hypothalamospinal tract. Damage to these neurons may result in an ipsilateral Horner's syndrome, which presents as meiosis and partial ptosis. There are also tracts which travel into and out of the cerebellum via the cerebellar peduncles of the brainstem. I won't go into the details of the spinocerebellar tracts here, but they behave functionally as ipsilateral tracts, and thus damage will cause an ipsilateral ataxia. Many of the nuclei of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves also lie in the brainstem. Signs and symptoms will depend on which cranial nerves are affected. If you're unsure of the functions of the cranial nerves, I suggest you watch this video to recap. Physiological centres include the reticular formation, which is involved in consciousness and arousal. Damage to the reticular formation may present as depressed consciousness. Now we can piece this information together to predict the likely symptoms from a brainstem stroke. Here, I'll talk about a syndrome affecting the medulla, Wallenberg syndrome, another syndrome affecting the midbrain, Weber's syndrome, and finally, a syndrome affecting the pons, locked in syndrome. Wallenberg syndrome is also called lateral medullary syndrome, or PICA syndrome. Given that it affects the medulla, the most likely responsible blood vessels are the vertebral arteries or pica. This is the commonest of the brainstem strokes. We can consider its presentation in terms of the brainstem structures that are affected, as divided into the three main categories we talked about earlier, tracts, nuclei and physiological centres. Affected tracts within the medulla include the spinothalamic tract, which results in contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. Also, the spinocerebellar tracts can be affected, causing an ipsilateral ataxia. 
Finally, the hypothalamospinal tract can also be affected, causing an ipsilateral Horner's syndrome. In Wallenberg syndrome, there are three main cranial nerve nuclei that are affected. The nucleus ambiguous, the vestibular nucleus, and the cranial nerve 5 nucleus. Nucleus ambiguous is associated with the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, and thus damage results in a hoarse voice and dysphagia. Damage to the vestibular nucleus can cause vertigo and nystagmus. Damage to the cranial nerve 5 nucleus results in ipsilateral facial loss of temperature and pain. In terms of physiological centres, the reticular formation can also be affected, which results in depressed consciousness. This clinical picture can be remembered with the mnemonic DANVER. This stands for dysphagia, ataxia, nystagmus, vertigo, anesthesia and Horner's syndrome. Now let's move on to talk about the next syndrome, Weber's syndrome. This is caused by an interruption to the blood supply to the midbrain, typically the posterior cerebral artery. The main tract affected is the corticospinal tract, which results in a contralateral weakness. The main nucleus affected is the cranial nerve 3 nucleus, which results in an ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy. Physiological centres are often not affected. Finally, a syndrome that affects the pons includes locked-in syndrome, which may be caused by a stroke affecting the basilar artery or also a traumatic brain injury. The two main tracts affected in locked-in syndrome are the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts. Damage to the corticospinal tract in the pons results in quadriplegia. Damage to the corticobulbar tract results in anarthria, which is an inability to speak. As a result, sufferers are often heavily dependent on their carers. There are several cranial nerve nuclei involved, but clinically, bilateral damage to the abducens nuclei restricts horizontal eye movement. However, vertical gaze is not affected as the oculomotor nucleus lies in the midbrain and is thus unaffected. Physiological centres are often not affected in locked-in syndrome. Therefore, there is no loss of consciousness and cognitive faculties can remain intact. So, to recap, brainstem strokes are typically caused by an occlusion of a vessel in the posterior circulation. Signs and symptoms include those associated with the three main functions of the brainstem. Damage to the tracts may present with a motor or sensory disturbance, ataxia or Horner's syndrome. Damage to cranial nerve nuclei may present as cranial nerve dysfunction, which will depend on which nuclei are affected. Damage to physiological centres such as the reticular formation may present with diminished consciousness. The most important brainstem stroke to remember, Wallenberg syndrome, can be remembered with the acronym DANVER, which stands for dysphagia, ataxia, nystagmus, vertigo, anesthesia, and Horner's syndrome. I hope you found this video useful. Don't forget to give it a like, and subscribe to Sutton Brain Hub for our future videos. Subscribe to Sutton Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.